Desert Island Discs. As usual, the castaway is introduced by Roy Plumley. This week, our castaway is the principal comedian with the Doyle Cart Opera Company, John Reed. John, how well do you think you could endure loneliness? I could endure it. I, I wouldn't like it, I don't think. What would you be happiest to got away from? I think maybe the turmoil, maybe the... the reading of the newspapers of so much sort of discontent in the world. I don't mind the bustle of a city or anything. I don't mind the noise. I, I love, I lap all that up. I don't like the fighting. I don't like the that side of it, I think. What would you want music to do for you on the island? Remind you of the past? Oh, but definitely. I've got so much to remember, you know, at my age. <laughs> <laughs> at your age. Um, we know you as a singer and comedian. Are you also a musician? I mean, have you had musical training to play an instrument? Oh, yes. I had I had my a certain amount of singing lessons and uh, piano. I play the piano, but just for my own amusement. What's the first record you've chosen? Uh, Rachmaninoff. Why? And what? Well, it's the um, second piano concerto, and, and just simply because I love it. Closing passage of the Rachmaninoff Second Piano Concerto, Vladimir Askenazi with the Moscow Philharmonic Orchestra. What's your second disc? My second disc is Ada Alsop, soprano. Yes, singing. It part. came from my hometown, of course. I knew her very well. She's passed away now. I loved her very dearly. I like to hear her singing The Last Rose of Summer, I think. If you want to know why, it's because it's Darlington. It's my home. It's the North. from Darlington, John. Any theatre background? No, not really. Uh, um, my mother was a singer. Mm -hmm. uh, my sister is, to me, a brilliant musician. She's the clever one of the family, I would think. That's my middle sister. I yes. have three, actually. When I say I came from Darlington, it's not quite true. I was born at Close House near Bishop Auckland. I moved to 
Darlington when I was about 11. Yes. What was your ambition as, as a child? What did you want to do? The only sort of thing I could do well, I think, was paint or anything on the artistic side. I wanted to be a, a commercial artist. I remember my mother taking me down, and they said, yes, they would take us all right, you see, but, um, of course, when I came out, there wouldn't be any work there, so that was squashed. Yes. What did you do? Well, I then went into a builder's office, did the pay slips and everything. I remember my first job was to walk along a plank, you know, about two stories up and get the time sheets from the masons and the tilers and one thing. I nearly died. Yes, it was worrying. And, um, and from there I went into a, um insurance office, Pearl Insurance. Mm -hmm. And uh, then the war came and I was a um, tool fitter, instrument maker. Yes. It worked, it used to work at two-tenths of a thou. I couldn't do it now, but I did it then. And when did the theatre come into your life? The theatre didn't come into my life until after the war, or, or, or the tail end of the war, actually. And that happened because um, when I got home, there was a, a girlfriend I knew. She was going along to a play reading, and I went along as a sort of a spectator, and they asked me to read in for this part, and from that I got the lead in this sort of semi-professional company. Mm -hmm. And I, I played the part, and from then on it went. The next thing after that was that suddenly someone knocked at my door and said, would I play the the juvenile leads in this repertory company, which was Keith James Enterprises. I think it was Saltburn I played first. And uh, I said, well, how do you know what I can do? He said, well, I've seen you walk on the stage and make an exit, and it's good enough for me. And it started from there. <laughs> and after that, my father was there, and I came to look after the business. And um, I was met in the street by somebody who'd been in the doily car, Dr. Company, and said, how do you feel about going back on the stage? He said, and I said, of course, I'm always interested. And she said to me, well, um, I'll arrange an audition for you. They're looking for an understudy for Peter Pratt, who was playing the principal role in those days. And I learnt the Nightmare Song and went up to Glasgow for my first audition. Yes. And they said, thank you very much. We'll let you know. I thought, well, that's that. It was only an experiment anyway. A week later, they asked me to go again. And when I'd done the whole lot and dialogue and everything else, you see, there was a deathly hush in the theatre. And they said... Um, Thank you very much, Mr. Reed. We'll let you know. And I thought, well, I've gone too far this time, you see. And then when I got into the wings, Mr. Frederick Lloyd, who was a general manager, said, we want you, Mr. Reed. How soon can you come? Yes. So you joined as understudy to Peter Pratt. I did. Were you a Gilbert and Sullivan enthusiast already? I didn't know anything about Gilbert and Sullivan. You'd never played it, never seen it? Never, never. I, I think I'd seen it once, but, I mean, that is very vague. I think I saw Martin Green, but it is very vague. Yes. I mean, I, I did mention this actually to Mr. Lloyd when I came off, and I said, I don't know Gilbert and Sullivan. He said, well, we prefer that. He said, we can we can sort of start you off the way we mean you to yes. go. Uh, you've mentioned Martin Green and Peter Pratt. What was the line of succession of the principal comedians? The first was George Grossmith, then came Sir Henry Lytton, then Martin Green, Peter Pratt, and I'm the fifth in line of succession, I think. Yes. Now, your successor to a long tradition in Gilbert Sullivan, how much originality can you bring to it? I think quite a lot, actually. I think you do it rather slyly, but I think, <laughs> it, but I think you can do it quite a lot. I yes. think uh, one slips things in here and there, you know, and then suddenly it, it, it's accepted as tradition. How long were you understudied before you started playing? I part? think about seven years, actually. Were you? How yeah. long have you been with the company altogether? 21 years. Oh, well, you should know something about Gilbert and Sullivan. <laughs> well, there's still a lot to learn, I feel. <laughs> Let's have another record, John. What next? The Dagio for Strings, I think. This is my mood music. This is what I would sit a long time and think about and remember by.
Samuel Barber's Adagio for Strings, played by the strings of the Philadelphia Orchestra, conducted by Eugene Ormandy. The Dolly Cart Company only plays Gilbert and Sullivan, never anything else. No, nothing else. Oh, well, of course, there is the one up from Cox and Box, and that was written by um, Sullivan and uh, Benand. Yes, the, the one actor. Benand, yes. The Dolly Cart Company has no permanent home. Not really. I suppose it's the Savoy, if anything. But you often come into London to another theatre, to well, the... Well, of course, of course, Wales, I mean... Uh, even I... the Festival Hall. Sure. I think, I mean, there's probably a, a play or whatever going on at the Savoy, and it's successful. You can't turn them out to put us back there anyway. Yes. So um, you've been on tour for 21 years? 21 years. There's a London season most years, isn't there? Or every year. Yes, we have another one this year. And I love it, of course, because I can live at home. I'm no longer on tour. Of course. It must be very difficult touring now. Your hotels are terribly expensive. Digs are practically non-existent. How do you manage? Well, it, of course, the old days, you know, the, they were wonderful old days with the old landladies. I mean, I could write a book about that. They were the wonderful days, I think, you know. I think the landladies, there were such characters, you know. Well, they've... I think perhaps three of them I have left, and I go. I would just go there rather than anywhere else. For instance, now I, I do have a caravan. Mm -hmm. There are about 12 of us in the company have caravans, as a matter of fact, simply because this is the easier way. It's like taking a little bit of your home with you and so forth. That's a very good solution. The company goes quite frequently to the United States and Canada. Yes. Where else does the company go? The last tour we did one week in uh, Copenhagen. How did that go? Extremely well. They were delightful. I, I was so glad that I was warned about this because um, on the first night they give you a slow hand clap, you know. And, uh, and of course, in England you would think you were getting the bird or something. Yes. But you've got to expect this, of course. And Flowers are handed up to me as well as everybody else, you see. And, of course, this would never happen in England. And you get all the chorus boys sniggering. But believe me, by the third night comes, if you don't get that slow hand clap and you don't get that bouquet of flowers, you think, what's happened? <laughs> <laughs> Let's have another record. What's number four on the list? Well, I've chosen Pineapple Paul. And I should think you would know why, really. I mean, to pick something from the operas would be terribly difficult to me. There's been so many people that have come and gone that I've loved very dearly. And uh, I thought Pineapple Paul has just that touch of everything. Yes. This is Charles McCarris's sort of musical switch of all the Absolutely. Solid and Absolutely. Even I have difficulty of picking some of them out sometimes. <laughs> Pineapple Paul Ballet Suite, Charles McCarris conducting the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra. Is the Doily Card Company subsidized? No, we are not subsidized at all. As well as the stage productions, of course, there are discs 
and one or two films. I've only made the one film, Macardo, and we did the backing for a um, cartoon on Radical. Yeah. I enjoyed that. I enjoyed making the film. I, I, I didn't like it when I saw it. It was terrible watching yourself on the film. It was <laughs> dreadful. There was great anxiety in 1961 because the Gilbert and Sullivan copyrights were going to run out. What difference did it make to the Doily Card Company? Well, as far as I know, it made no difference. Right now, I think they're as popular as ever I remember them being. There were competitive productions set up. Actually, we were when the copyright came off, we, we were at the Savoy. And I think the Saddler's Wells were performing, maybe Island and, and Mikado, I, I don't know quite. And uh, Sir Tyron Guthrie was playing uh, either HMS Pinafore or Pirates. But it made no difference to us whatsoever. Yes. In spite of hot Mikados and cool Mikados and Absolutely. all other I mean, sorts. I would play in the hot Mikado if anybody asked me. I would love it, you know. <laughs> I would go back to what I'm doing again. Yeah. That would be a little fun thing that would pop in here and there, but mm. that without, is where I would want to be. Without interfering with the mainstream? Yes. What are your personal plans, John? Are you going to stay with the GNS? Oh, yes, I'm going to stay with them, I think. I've been... Very, very happy with them for 21 years. And you I... don't get a feeling somehow that you're you're bedded and, and, and you're forgotten by large sections of the theatre? Oh, I think large sections of the theatre don't know anything about me at all. I'm quite sure of that. I think I'm only known to my Gilbert and Sullivan fans. That happy life with, with the company and Gilbert and Sullivan is Certainly. what you want. I mean, no matter what anybody says, oh, sure, in the company, you cannot go around on tour without little differences here and there. Of course they are there. But no matter what anybody says, they are a family. And by the end of the tour, you might hate them. You think, I don't want to see her or him again. <laughs> but when the holiday is over, you fall on one another's neck and say, where did he go? What did he do? It's just like a family. Let's have record number five. What have you got next? Record number five would be um, from La Vie Parisienne, I think. Offenbach. Offenbach. That's because there's a similarity with Gilbert and Sullivan, as you well know. And I want um, Cynthia Moray and Eric Schilling singing Little Flower because Cynthia was my very first friend in this company. She was playing the parts of Yum Yum, etc. When I joined, she's my dearest friend. I even live in the same street now. And um, I love the way she sings this particular piece with Eric Schilling. I'm a great fan of his. I shouldn't be. He plays my parts, of course, with the uh, Saddler's Wells Opera Company. Yes. And uh, I think he's extremely good, and I think the pair together are super.
Cynthia Moray and Eric Schilling in a song from Offenbach's La Vie Parisienne by the Saddler's Wells Opera Company. Let's have record number six straight away. Record number six uh, is the stripper. The stripper? Why? Well, the stripper to me is so typically American. And I would want to be reminded of all those American tours. And I think this is about the only record that will bring everything back. It is so sort of... It's just American, isn't it? I mean, if you've heard it, I don't know. I have indeed. And um, the rush, the bustle, the, the burlesques, everything. David Rose and his orchestra, the stripper. John, what are your hobbies? I've got so many hobbies. It's, I would keep you here till midnight, I think, if I started. I um, The principal ones? The principal one, I think, always remains as oil painting. Mm -hmm. This is because I think I never... I, I never <laughs> will perfect it, and I go on trying to get better and better. I mean, a hobby with me is that I wouldn't... If I want to make a basket work, or I want to make a lampshade, or I want to make a pair of trousers, I do it. Once I do it, I can do it. I'm finished. You can make a pair of trousers? Oh, sure. I've done this sort of thing. I've made <laughs> shirts and things. I, it yeah. all started off as a bet, as a matter of fact. Somebody bet me I couldn't, and I did. Mm -hmm. I made everything I wore, my sports jacket, my shirt, and my trousers. Yeah. But once I could do it, it was finished. But painting, I will never, ever perfect. Could you run up a handy waterproof little shelter on a desert island? Oh, you bet I could. I would build. Sure, I would build. Yes. Are you a good cook? Yes, I think I'm a good cook. I, I like to think I am. I'm very, very interested in it. Can you collect some food together? Can you fish? Can you cultivate? Sure, I'm very adaptable. I would fish all right. Would you try to escape? I don't think I would try to escape. I, I wouldn't go right out into the... The dark, dark ocean there. Night time on the ocean looks dreadful to me. No, I wouldn't try to escape. Right. I'll wait to be picked up. Somebody will come along, won't they? I hope so. <laughs> Record number seven. Record number seven is um, Richard Kiley singing a theme song from The Man of La Mancha. <laughs> And the night with his banners all bravely unfurled Now hurls down his gauntlet for thee Oh, my God. 
Richard Kiley and Irving Jacobson in the New York production of Man of La Mancha. Now we come to your last record. What's that to be? My last record is... would have to be some Greek music, I think. Mm -hmm. I love my holidays in Greece. I love the sound of the Greek music. It's just holiday music. Dance the Sertaki, played by Stelios Zafiru and his Buzukia. Now we've come to the time when you have to decide which one disc you'd take with you if you only had one. Well, I think it would have to be Rachmaninoff. Right. And one luxury to take with you? Oh, definitely. Lots and lots of canvases and lots and lots of oil paints and loads of brushes. I go through those very fast. Right. And one book apart from the Bible and Shakespeare. Well, I thought a lot about this because I think that I... I don't think I've read very many books twice. I would get bored. I think I would like a large book on do-it-yourself. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And thank you, John Reed, for letting us hear your Desert Island dinner. And thank you very much for having me. Goodbye, everyone. guest in this evening's program was John Reed. The interviewer was Roy Plumley and the producer Ronald Cook. Next Saturday at 7, the castaway will be the artist Terence Cunier. <laughs>